I guess my story begins um, when I was a psychology student back in the day. Uh, and in order to go to school, I got awarded a social scholarship. And part of my responsibilities as a recipient of this uh, social scholarship was that I had to uh, tutor an unprivileged child from one of the rough neighborhoods in the city where I lived back in Israel. Um, and when I went to meet this woman that was actually in charge of matching up between the students and the children, she called me to the side and she said, Adam, I have a really good match for you. Would you be interested uh, in tutoring a schizophrenic child? And I was very interested in tutoring a schizophrenic child. I think up until that point, I've already been working um, in a variety of different psychiatric environments, mostly really interacting with much older people. Uh, people that were already um, in what is called like the chronic stages, or more accurately, the chronified stages of uh, different psychotic disorders. People that have been in and out of psychiatric institutions for many years and medicalized for decades and so. Um, and I wanted to see what schizophrenia manifested like in a very young uh, kid. And, it took me a relatively long time, I guess, to realize the extent of the damage that this woman had uh, done, not on purpose, to my relationship with this kid by presenting him first and foremost as a schizophrenic kid. Because from that moment onwards, I kind of internalized and assumed that I was first and foremost to interact with a pathology that happened to inhabit like this human kid. Um, and eventually, when I did manage to see through the diagnosis, I actually met like this incredibly you know, lovely, wonderful, warm, affectionate, uh, fiercely intelligent, and with a wild imagination uh, child. Um, his favorite subject to discuss with me and anybody else um, really was uh, time travel. He was convinced 100% he was a time traveler. Uh, but not only that, he would come back with his like, very elaborate, colorful, dense descriptions of all of the adventures he was having, you know, hopping along space time and all of the. Uh, historical figures and pop icons that he was meeting in different periods and like the places he was visiting and so on. Uh, and it was fascinating for me. In the beginning, it was fascinating really because all of his behavior and narrative kind of very closely correlated with everything I was learning about what psychosis is, like all of the paradigmatic uh, symptoms that we usually warrant kind of that kind of diagnosis, like, you know, like hallucinations and delusions and uh, disorganized speech and thought. Um, and I was constantly kind of trying to poke holes in his story. Right, I, would ask, I would ask him, so where's your time traveling machine? Right? Or can you tell me more about the dynamics of time travel and like, the math of it? And he would just laugh at me, really. I, I think he, he was uh, frustrated that I wouldn't understand how easy it was. I mean, for him, it was self-evident, not only that he was time traveling, but everybody could really time travel. It was just a matter of closing your eyes and doing it. And I didn't really think, uh, or I never really believed that he was a time traveler. I think for a, for, a, for a time, I did try to romanticize him. Uh, kind of like placing him into this uh, archetype of the mad genius, Nikola Tesla, Isaac Newton, I don't know, like many, many historical figures, figures like that. Um, and I never really believed that, but I did understand at some point that my belief was completely irrelevant to his experience. And that whatever he was experiencing, it was real for him. I think I was just at that point where I tried, when I stopped kind of invalidating his narrative or uh, delegitimizing the experience or also kind of romanticizing the experience that we actually became really good friends and we kind of opened this very clear channel of communication where we can uh, just hold space for each other's experience. And I think I really appreciated that because I think, I mean, I believe that I was the first adult in his life uh, that ever like was not trying to tell him that it's crazy and so on and so forth. Um, and this idea of the primacy of lived experience versus expert knowledge is something that all of us are very familiar with, I guess, like you know, the psychedelic community, or at least people that are attending a psychedelic conference. Uh, many of us have had in the past, or have all the time, or sometimes, like the kind of experiences that are usually uh, pathologized and even criminalized by you know, the institutionalized whatever. Uh, but we know from our own experiences, these are many, many times kind of experiences that are not necessarily pathological, but actually very meaningful sometimes. Uh, even though they're not considered to be, let's say, valid channels through which we can gain information or knowledge about the world around us, or you know, the vast space inside us. Um, one paradigmatic, well, not really paradigmatic, but one experience that may kind of contribute a lot towards a psychotic disorder is auditory, auditory hallucinations. Okay? So this experience of hearing voices. Uh, in the West, this is an experience that is highly pathologized. Like people who hear voices will oftentimes not end up very well, but this is not universally so. Okay? So one example um, that we have, for example, from the ethnographic uh, literature comes from the Hopi people. So Hopi men, um, the Hopi Pueblo people in North America, actually it has been observed that hearing voices um, is a 
pretty normal and important uh, aspect of what it means of the grieving process. So let's say a Hopi man just uh, lost his wife, uh, like this, uh, this person just died, and then very shortly after her death, uh, this man will start hearing her voice. And she may be saying like all sorts of things, like, I don't know, like even though I'm dead, I'm still looking out for you from you know, the afterlife, or uh, even though I'm dead, the kids are still here, so don't forget to feed them, or all sorts of different things, right? Uh, and hearing her voice gives this man the courage and the strength um, and the courage, really, that he needs to get over this and you know, continue with life and integrate her death into you know, his experience. So if we mistook this experience of hearing her voice uh, for a universally valid objective observable sign of an underlying pathology, but then we try to medicalize this person or you know, suppress this experience with neuroleptics and psychotics, we would be uh, depriving him from going like a very important integration process of this experience. Uh, this has been observed also in the West. This is true also in our societies. Yes, sorry, okay, yeah. Oh, there we go, thanks, uh, appreciate it. Uh, this, has, this has been observed also in the West, because it's not only um, in Hopi people, but also it has been observed in elderly populations all over the West. Uh, there's an anthropologist, Tanya Lurman, in Stanford University. She has done really interesting uh, work on auditory hallucinations, and she's found basically that, for example, culture plays an incredibly important uh, role not only in the content of the things that people hear, but also in the, you know, the emotional charge of it and the intentionality uh, of it. So for example, she found uh, people in Western societies in the United States, uh, um, societies that are very individualistic and very competitive, people who hear voices, that hear voices are extremely harsh and very threatening, uh, generally unpleasant, usually directed at the individual. Right? People who live in societies that are much more collaborative or still kind of have this uh, communal lifestyle like in India or Nigeria, uh, people classify the voice they hear as more uh, benign or even neutral or benign, and they're usually, not usually, aimed at the individual. So they're just more aimed at the community. So it's more like group gossip. Group uh, gossip. Uh, and the point she makes is that, you know, the content of this voice is not merely kind of like an unimportant byproduct of a mental, of a, a psychopathology, but actually content that is very important. Uh, whether for recovery or just as a meaningful um, life experience. Um, where am I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Um, so, ah, okay, so one interesting factor that can contribute towards uh, deciding how will a particular culture experience these experiences, of course, has to do, let's say, with the ordering cosmology or the metaphysical substrate upon which a culture is built. So we in the West, we can hear to our own very materialistic mythologies, right? Uh, where even the most basic of all experiences, which is the experience of experience itself, like consciousness of awareness, is kind of understood to be an emergent property of brain or kind of an epiphenomenon of, of some neural interplay, uh, an anomaly really under the mechanistic model. Uh, but this is not universal, this is not an assumption that is universally shared, of course. And I currently live in the Amazon rainforest, in the jungle in Peru. And in the rainforest, for example, there are still many societies uh, that adhere to sets of beliefs that some anthropologists would call animistic belief, uh, animism. But animism basically, let's say, entails the experience that everything and everybody in the world has a soul. Okay? So humans have souls, but obviously also trees have souls, and plants have souls, and rivers, and clouds, and rocks, and weather patterns. Uh, everything has a soul, right? Um, Graham Harvey, he's a religious uh, scholar of religious studies, he has a nice definition of animism. He says, animism is the lived experience that the world is a community of persons, and only a few of those persons are human persons. Okay? So there's human persons, but there's also tree persons, uh, and bird persons, and plant persons, and so on and so on. Uh, and that life is always lived in reciprocal relationships with all of these different communities of persons. And in these societies, the role of the shaman, okay, uh, the shaman is basically the person who is in charge of maintaining the balance and the harmony uh, and the reciprocal relationships between all of these different layers of persons. Okay. Um, so in animistic communities, like, I don't speak about animism as if it was a primitive or archaic theology or a failed epistemology. Okay? This is a lived and felt experience of people who spend all of their lives embedded within layers and layers and layers of sentient, intelligent, communicative, uh, intentional plants and fungi and animals. Okay? Um, so in this kind of context, let's say, if a person was like receiving a direct communication from the Lupuna tree, or he was hearing the voice of the Ayauma tree, and he went to the community and he said, hey, you know, I'm having this really weird experience when I'm talking to trees, they'll be like, well, that's not weird at all, okay? Actually, you may want to, you know, train, or, you know, go to that person that will train you, 
uh, because you actually may be you know, very beneficial to your community because you can open the channel where we can communicate with the tree people or the plant people uh, to further you know, our reciprocal relationships and maintain the harmony and balance. This person will very, very likely start dieting. In the Western Amazonia, uh, let's say the most prevalent system of medicine is called vegetalism. Vegetalism is not really, like, I mean, it's a kind of constantly evolving, very eclectic system of medicine. But one of the main training methodologies for people who you know, want to learn this is dieting. Dieting basically entails you know, like long periods of isolation um, and austerity that you know, people go into these very meditative states in order to open a channel of communication and kind of, uh, with one plant or one tree, or the spirit of that plant or the spirit of one tree, to receive information uh, and later on enlist their services for sorcery and healing and so on. Um, so people speak with trees and plants all the time. This is not a real uh, thing. And uh, where I was going with this? Okay. So um, this idea right, that non-ordinary experiences can be um, adaptive or healthy or even therapeutical is also kind of gaining a lot of traction you know, in Western, different sectors of Western society. This is kind of evidenced by conferences like this one. Um, and places where I work, like Temple of the Way of Light, um, that are incorporating elements of these medical traditions in order to treat uh, let's, let's, like some of the psycho-spiritual epidemics that seem to become inherent to our liquid uh, uh, individualistic alienated societies. So mostly depression, um, anxiety, like high indices of trauma and so on. Um, and we, I mean, we know, we kind of like know that this is working very well. We have, at the Temple of the World Light right now, we have one of the most comprehensive uh, longitudinal studies that have been done in collaboration with the Beckley Foundation and ICERS, uh, assessing like the efficacy of ayahuasca for um, a variety of different uh, mental afflictions, mostly depression, anxiety, grief, uh, trauma, addictions, and just general well-being. Um, the results have actually been presented, like, preliminary results were presented in Oakland in April by my colleague and friend Deborah, uh, and they're very promising. And you know, even though ayahuasca and many other psychedelics are very promising as uh, therapeutical approaches, right, there are still many other people who ex whose experiences are much more meaningful and rich than psychopathologies to be treated. Okay? So for example, I'm going to introduce a term of neurodiversity. So there's a lot of people who uh, experience difference when others see pathology. Neurodiversity is a term that originated within the autistic community, people who um, uh, live with autism, who, experience, who you know, felt that their experience was, again, much richer, much more meaningful than just a pathology, who felt that uh, you know, it was just a different experience, but not necessarily pathological. And this is not nearly a consensus, obviously, within the uh, autistic community. There's many people still you know, that feel that we should come up with better drugs and better treatments to alleviate suffering. And so, so this is not... Uh, black or white is a huge gray area, but still for some people it makes sense to see uh, diversity with OLC pathology. Uh, we spoke before about auditory hallucinations, so it's a huge movement now that originated like 30 years ago in the Netherlands, uh, the Hearing Voices Network. People who um, hear voices or see, you know, visual things or just have like unusual uh, sensory perceptions, okay? And they gather, uh, there's groups all over the world and they gather and they speak about their experiences uh, in a non-pathologizing environment, right? So it's fine that when you know you do this, you can actually like derive much more meaning and learn strategies to cope with things from other people, uh, and not necessarily just pathologize the experiences. Um, the Icarus Project is a project that was started with people uh, with diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It's, now it's mostly an online forum. There's also local chapters in different places of the world. Uh, people who felt you know bipolar in the field all the time. Bipolar disorder is not necessarily a pathology, but actually a condition that affords them dangerous gifts. Uh, dangerous gifts that can be navigated consciously. Some people uh, find psychopharmaceuticals to be the best way to do so, but for other people it makes sense to use yoga or meditation or other techniques or uh, just like having like strong networks of support, you know, within communities. Um, but not necessarily uh, seeing it as a pathology. There's now a mad pride movement, right? So people who uh, identify as mad, who uh, take pride on being mad for its subversive qualities or uh, for the sanity of being mad in an insane world. People who you know, like, celebrate madness 
uh, as diversity, not as pathology as well. Uh, there are math studies in universities where um, people analyze, you know, like madness from the perspective of the math or psychiatry or psychology uh, or the industries around it from the perspective of mad people. Um, I think one of the, like ultimately one of the biggest threats that we face nowadays is a, like a lack of divergent perspectives. Like we're facing like increasingly this threat of a monoculturing of our mind, like this monoculture of our life experiences. And this monoculture of mind is a term that I borrowed from Vandana Shiva. She uses it in a slightly different context. Um, but I feel that like this uh, increasing monoculturing of our minds and experiences, kind of like the shared goal, whether implicit or explicit, of all sorts of different uh, institutions and enterprises, uh, as a war on drugs or, you know, institutionalized psychiatry or even uh, like extractive development policies or patriarchy, uh, colonialism for sure. I think one of the main ways that we have to um, resist this you know, increasing, increasing uh, um, you know, kind of colonization of our minds or monoculturing of our experiences is to form alliances between all the different collectives and groups and individuals who from very different perspectives are constantly uh, fighting for the validation of their life experiences and uh, striving and struggling to constantly expand you know, these very narrow uh, limits of um, what is normal and what is sane. And doing that, by, and, but for doing that, like, one of the ways to do that is um, to deconstruct first, right? Like this cultural and social construction of what we define to be abnormal and what we uh, define to be insane. And um, I think, you know, like, really it's about honoring not only the variety of religious experience or mystical experience or psychedelic experience, but also, uh, like, more generally, just, like, the infinite diversity of human experience. And this does not mean in any ways that mental illnesses does not, do not exist, obviously. I mean, it should be, like, abundantly evident by now to everybody that uh, mental illnesses are a biological reality, but just as much as they are also cultural realities and social realities. Uh, and by any means, we should keep like finding better drugs and better treatments for people who just want symptomatic relief, for people who want to alleviate the suffering. Uh, but we should, we should also like constantly be uh, looking for more effective therapies that do treat, um, you know, like things from the deep roots of affliction that really work on uh, bringing true healing uh, in a much deeper level. But also, you know, like we should be making a lot of space for these experiences that are experienced not inside as pathology, but uh, as difference and creating the spaces where that, those experiences can be integrated into the fabric of our societies. Uh, and also like, to keep examining the structural violence really that's from, that is kind of creating all this affliction um, in the first place. And I think also as mental practitioners and allies, it's very important that we you know, realize that it is not good enough to perpetuate like a culture where uh, patients become passive consumers of whatever pill is being peddled by the medical uh, industrial complex, but rather um, to be active co-creators of these spaces where we can actively and reciprocally depathologize um, each other. And, you know, by the end of the day, nobody really is an island of psychopathology. And madness and sanity and um, illness and health are always live in relationship with culture, in relationship with society, in relationship to the environment. And this is something that we can learn from Amazonian indigenous cultures. So nobody is really going to be fully healthy unless we are all healthy. Nobody is really going to heal until, unless everybody heals. And by everybody, we mean, of course, you know, our societies, our families, our communities, but also the rivers and the trees and the forests and our environments in general. Um, in reciprocal societies, actually, like the very definition of madness or the very definition of insanity tends to be parallel to the same kind of um, individualistic ideologies that we so glorify in the West. Definitions of madness would be like, um, you know, this idea that we can exploit communal resources as we want, or this idea that we can build, we can build pipelines across indigenous territories, or that it is okay to sell, uh, you know, things that are going to uh, break after six months or one, or one year just to keep the cycle of consumption going. So this idea of planned obsolescence, for example, would be one definition um, of what madness is. Yes, thanks. Um, so in Latin America, and increasingly 
in the global south, okay, and also increasingly in the south within the global north, there is this framework um, yeah, within the social sciences whose purpose is to counteract this monoculturing of experience and um, you know, to recover the diverse epistemological frameworks that are currently um, rendered invisible or obsolete or irrelevant by the dominant logics. And this framework is called uh, Epistemologias del Sur, or Epistemologies from the South. And one of these alternatives uh, is called in Quechua, Suma Causai. And Suma Causai is a good living. And the good living has been proposed as an, alterna an alternative uh, model to the current model of extractive development. Because the goal of Suma Causai is not necessarily to accumulate wealth, um, but actually to share. And uh, Suma Causai kind of puts the emphasis on everybody living in abundance and harmony and balance. And you know, this kind of sounds nice, but for many, many people it's, it's difficult to envision. And the reason it is so difficult to envision this is um, because this is a framework that falls outside of the margins of the dominant logic. So in order to really vision it and see it and understand it, uh, we need to step outside and kind of like take a radical epistemological lens. Um, so just to finish, the, the Chaikun Institute, which is a sister organization, the Temple of the Way of Light, uh, this is exactly what we do. Okay? Well, so what we're trying to do is to empower uh, and accompany indigenous-led movements okay, in their own struggles for, uh, the, you know, for uh, territorial struggles and um, social, uh, uh, social movements and environmental uh, justice. Uh, support projects that are prioritized according to the reported needs of the, of the residents and the population, putting like, the local epistemologies, uh, privileging the local epistemologies uh, over like, Western uh, ideas of what development should be. Um, where well, you can find much more about the work of Chaikuni. Uh, later, you can go online and check it out. There's like many, a lot of information out there, and you can also just approach. And I'm always very, very happy uh, to share this with everybody. Um, and of course, but well, just to finish, I go back to the beginning of the story. Um, Maur, the child that I met uh, many years ago. Uh, I think to this day, I'm still not sure if he was a time traveler or not. Uh, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the limits of my own imagination to really uh, comprehend you know, what the experience is like. Uh, but I do think that you know, ultimately, uh, nobody, or no, nobody can really know uh, who's going to be like that time traveler that's going to shatter like, all of, every notion that we have about what is possible in the world. Uh, or from where is that spark of inspiration or genius is going to come from? From what uh, invisible or obsolete or just not, you know, accounted for epistemology or ethical system or spiritual system? That you know, key insight is going to spring. That's going to really uh, bring about that revolution, paradigmatic revolution in Western society. Um, and the whole point of this was that I think we should make room for that uh, by including different experiences in our definitions of what is normal and what is sane and so on. Thank you.